favor, señor. Uh, ¿Dónde está mi uh, equipage? No comprendo, señor. Favor de pasar por aquí. I was so sure I'd learned the right pronunciation. But when I tried my phrase book Spanish at Maracaibo Airport, nobody could understand a word. It brought home what I was told in the briefing sessions by Creole. I'm starting work in a foreign country for an American oil company, and I'll have to learn its ways, just as Creole has. We each represent the United States here, in the eyes of the Venezuelans. My baggage was at customs, as I should have known, and my English got me through. Then the language problem ended for the moment. Creole had sent another American engineer up from the oil fields to meet me and show me around before I reported the engineering office. me a regular guided tour of Maracaibo. Everything looked just as tropical as I had expected, and only 10 degrees north of the equator, it was just as hot as I had expected. The first thing that surprised me on that ride was the... In other residential areas, I saw houses built in the old Spanish tradition. Then came the new again, huge modern apartment buildings. I almost felt I hadn't left home when we passed a big Sears Roebuck store. Another familiar sight was a used car lot full of American autos. But the center of the city is Spanish. And you begin to realize that Maracaibo is almost 400 years old. The narrow downtown streets along which we drove were once invaded by Morgan's pirate raiders. The contrast really hit me when we drove up to our hotel, just about the most modern one I've ever seen. It's a great introduction to a job in Venezuela, but it's only for one night. Pardon my luxury, dear. I'm at the pool at the hotel as I write this. My next letter will be from Lagunillas, because I leave for the oil fields tomorrow. Love to you and the boys, Jim. To you and the boys, Jim. Where is Daddy, Mommy? Well, Jeff. I'll just show you. We're here in the United States. And Daddy is down here in Venezuela. He wrote the letter from Maracaibo. But by now he's down here where the Lake Maracaibo oil fields are. That's where Daddy is working, Jeff. And when he finds a place for us to live, we're going down there, too. Dear Anne, well, here I am at Lagunillas in the oil fields. My trip from Maracaibo started with a ferry ride across the neck of the lake near the entrance from the Caribbean. Lake Maracaibo seemed narrow here, but it's actually 60 miles wide at one point and about 120 miles long. After leaving the ferry, the drive to Lagunillas took about an hour. Most of it along a road built by Creole and the other oil companies back in the 30s. The offshore wells run along the edge of Lake Maracaibo for more than 40 miles, sometimes reaching beyond the horizon. It's quite a sight. 
But the most thrilling sight to me was my first view of our new home, Lagunillas, right on the lake shore. It's both a community and an industrial center. Part of my work will be in the office here and part out on the lake, helping with supervision and planning for this portion of the oil field. I started meeting people the moment we arrived. My first stop was at the administration building where I checked in at my office. My boss, the district petroleum engineer, is a young fellow. They give responsibility early here. I found that the engineering staff is both Venezuelan and American, or North American as they say here. Then I spent the evening getting settled in my quarters. A long and lonely evening, dear, without you. The next day, I was taken out on the lake to see the field procedures. Before that day was over, I felt as though I were back in the Navy. headed out into the lake, I saw that there was no open water ahead, just rows of oil wells. And as an engineer, I know that what I saw is just part of it, that under the water there are hundreds of miles of pipeline connecting the wells. The wells form a geometrically exact pattern, carefully spaced, to tap the oil in the most efficient manner. Creole and the Venezuelan government work together to make sure that the field is planned for the best long-term utilization of the country's oil resources. For example, a careful check is kept on the pressure of the gas, which forces most of the oil to the surface without pumping. which comes up with the oil is not wasted or burned off. Seven miles offshore, I saw one of our huge plants which injects the natural gas back into the formation. That maintains the pressure to keep the oil flowing. The drilling is done with power and equipment from big barges tied up to the well platforms. I'll be working on the barges a lot of the time and I'll have to speak Spanish because 92% of Creole's employees are Venezuelan. That includes a large number of the engineers and more than half of the supervisors, like the tool pushers who boss the drilling crews. Practically all the skilled workers of Venezuela, and with their housing and other benefits, they receive about as much as men doing identical jobs in the United States. Employee relations policies are about the same too, and oil companies here operate under modern labor laws. I already feel at home in my job, even though I sometimes go to and from work in a boat. Sure, it's a different country and I'm a foreigner here, but the Venezuelans have already made me feel welcome. All I have to do now is lick that language problem. 
Dear Anne and the boys, here's the latest news on our house. I've been looking over all the staff houses, and my favorite is the kind built high off the ground to let the breeze under and incidentally provide a wonderful open-air playroom. They're completely shuttered with aluminum to keep out the daytime heat. I saw the interior of one house on Sunday when a Venezuelan employee invited me over. He's being transferred to a better job at Creole headquarters in Caracas, and I hope to get the house. His wife showed me all through. This one had two bedrooms. Some have more. I was pretty happy about the possibility, but it didn't work out. As luck would have it, the house has been assigned to another family who've been waiting some time, meanwhile living in one of the Quonset huts. And so that's how we happen to be moving into their Quonset hut on October 1st. I rushed right over to see it. It's temporary housing, of course, but these people had fixed theirs up attractively. We can do the same while we're waiting for one of the permanent houses. We'll need just about everything we have at home, except the kitchen sink. So you better start packing. Be prepared for a heavy social life, too. Everything from bridge parties at home to sports at the club. My favorite spot is the pool, even though it's mighty lonely there without you. No fun at all, really. You asked about medical care. There's a Creole dispensary for both employees and dependents. I've looked over the school, too. It's also maintained by the company. The principal is a North American, but education is in both English and Spanish. They try to make all the children bilingual. And Jeff will start learning Spanish in the first grade. Mike, ¿qué hacen los niños? Los niños juegan. ¿Dónde juegan los niños? Los niños juegan en el patio. Shirley, ¿con quién juegan los niños? Los niños juegan con el amigo y el perro. Those kids made me feel a little ashamed of my Spanish, or lack of it. Everything I've described is inside the oil camp. The Creole is now trying to get away from the old idea of a company camp. Eventually, they want their people to live in regular towns, where that's possible. I saw some results of this new policy when I visited Creole's refinery at Amway recently. We drove through the residential area where many of the homes were built by private contractors, partially financed by the company. The houses are sold or rented to anyone, not just Creole employees. The worker is even helped with his down payment if he needs it. But after that, he and his family are on their own, just as in the United States. Instead of company commissaries, they have privately operated shopping centers. Some of them started with loans from Creole. The idea of this community integration project is to make people independent instead of having to look to the company for everything. It's an interesting new development. And speaking of new developments... Anne, 
I'm being sent for a month's study of Spanish in Caracas. That's where I'll be writing from next. I traveled to Caracas by air, of course, landing at Maiketea, right on the shore of the Caribbean. Then we started up through the mountains on one of the most remarkable highways in the world, the Autopista. It took us just 20 minutes to climb to 3,000 feet, the altitude of Caracas. Suddenly, we were in the city. It's laid along a narrow valley just behind the coastal mountains. The downtown area is dominated by the central Simon Bolivar a building development something like Radio City, except that superhighways go through it and under it. I had the driver take me for a ride around the city. He showed me the new sections in the east, where just 10 years ago there were sugarcane and coffee plantations. tremendous amount of color on the buildings, sometimes just to vary pattern. And sometimes for artistic effect, giant mosaics, six to ten stories high. Some of the residential areas are almost futuristic. But others are so quiet and tranquil that you seem to be in another world. Since that first day, I've spent most of my time studying Spanish. I'm even writing this letter between classes. But tomorrow is Sunday, and I expect to see more of the city. I've told you how modern much of Caracas is. Well, if the rest of the place is modern, they'll have to coin a new word for University City. Believe me, this is no ivy-covered campus. University City is one of the impressive sights of Caracas, another example of the prosperity oil has helped to bring to Venezuela. University isn't tucked away by itself. It's part of the city. And it provides the city with many things, from medical care to a beautiful stadium for soccer and track, and another for baseball. The Caraqueños are especially proud of their low-rent housing projects. Huge apartment buildings in clusters on the hillsides. We have nothing like them at home. But some things are just like home. The new business sections, the shop windows filled with goods purchased in the United States, and the familiar look of all the American cars, not to mention the traffic. I've also seen some of the historic spots of Caracas, like Plaza Bolivar, the old Spanish square with the statue to the liberator, who led six South American nations to freedom. And Casa Natal, the birthplace and home of Simon Bolivar, 
The old colonial house is now a museum of Venezuelan history. I was told that many families in Caracas still live in gracious old homes like Bolivar's, showing only blank walls on the outside and looking toward beautiful inner patios open to the sky. My Caracas life, for most of the past month, has centered on just one building, the Spanish school. We Norte Americanos study Spanish eight hours a day, five and a half days a week. It's been hard work, but it's been worthwhile. Señor Mor, ¿dónde trabaja usted? Yo trabajo en Lagunillas con la Creole Petroleum Corporation. Perfectamente bien, Señor Mor. I'm really learning the language now. Just wait until you hear me when you reach Maracaibo next week. Atención, por favor. La línea aeropostal venezolana anuncia la llegada del vuelo número 201 procedente de Miami. LAV, the Venezuelan airline, announces the arrival of flight 201 from Miami. Su atención, por favor. Después de cumplir requisitos de emigración y aduana, los pasajeros saldrán por la salida este del edificio. Following immigration and custom clearance, passengers will exit at the east end of the terminal. this all? No, we have two more bags. Tenemos más equipaje. Wait, Jim. Tenemos dos maletas más. Una grande y una pequeña. La pequeña es mía. Oh, no. We've been studying Spanish, too. Well, that's how it goes. You work hard to impress your family, and they end up telling the porter what luggage he has to find. It's good to have them here, though, and I'm looking forward to a good life with them during this assignment in Venezuela.